Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a joy it is to be gathered together for worship. I'm grateful to see those of you who are gathered with us in person. <clears throat> and thankful for the technology that allows us to welcome those of you who are gathered with us by way of technology. Now, whether you're worshiping with us in person or virtually, I want to make sure that you hear an invitation to participate in worship next week on November 21st by sharing something that you are grateful for as we create an altar of gratitude. So you're invited to bring an object or a picture or an artistic uh, rendering, whatever you might have that can represent something in your life that you're grateful for. And uh, you're gonna be invited to place it on, on a table and to, to lift up a, a word or a phrase um, of gratitude to God for for that. Um, so if you are worshiping with us virtually and you would like to see something you're grateful for placed on that altar, you can send it to us by email or, or contact me um, by my cell phone and I will be happy to print off a picture uh, or find something similar to, to the item you're wanting and, and bring it to present on your behalf. Um, I do want to note a couple of things happening in the building this week. Uh, we do have uh, UMW on Tuesday at 1.30 here at IVES. I also want to make sure that you know that SPPRC is going to be meeting jointly with the first SPPRC uh, at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening here at IVES. So we're, we're meeting both churches together here. Before anybody gets nervous, this is part of the uh, sort of yearly calendar of things that we do. There's a, a form that they fill out to let the bishop and the cabinet know whether or not you want to hang on to me and uh, because that you all are now linked with one another it's best to fill that form out together and to, to sort of be able to establish how uh, this appointment as a joint appointment is working for both churches and so we're starting that habit this year with a with a meeting together so that's what's going to be happening if you have strong opinions one way or another about whether or not you want to hang on to me you might want to find one of your ppr members and let them know uh, before that meeting Monday evening, uh, but otherwise I have great faith in, in all that's going to come out of beginning that process of, of meeting together from time to time. Uh, it is that time of year where we have a lot of administrative work to do as a church. So our church conference will be held on Sunday, December 5th at uh, Central United Methodist in Lawrence. Um, we're going to meet with all the other churches in our network, so that's even smaller than our district. Um, it's primarily churches in the Wellsville, Clearfield, Lawrence, Baldwin, Vinland, that kind of um, real close geographic area. So in addition to taking care of the paperwork that we have to do, it's going to be an opportunity um, to, to talk with the other churches in our network about what we can do together as a network and an opportunity to meet uh, our new DS. For the third year in a row, or for the second year in a row, we have a new DS, um, Reverend Mickey McCorkle. And so I hope that you all will get a chance to meet her and to get to know a little bit about her ministry. Uh, we're gonna finalize our paperwork for that conference uh, Sunday, November 21st. Um, no, yes, Sunday, November 21st, right after worship. Um, so we will have uh, all of that paperwork ready to go and we can take a look at it and go through and, and officially vote it, vote for it so that we can have it all signed and, and ready for, for Mickey. Um, on the 5th. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? I have. Yes. I have three November, December upper rooms behind me. Okay, there are three more November, December upper rooms behind Ellen, and she wants to make sure that they find a good home where they can uh, be part of somebody's um, spiritual life. So if you or someone you know could use those uh, as a quick and easy resource for a little time centered with God, um, please feel free to take one. All right, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Join yours with mine as we pray our opening, as I pray our opening prayer. O living God of past and future, we praise you for this present moment. Fill us with your joy, empower us with your Holy Spirit, that our strength may be renewed to sing a new song of your glory in a world which longs for your justice and peace. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, in whom we become your new creation. Amen. Will you stand as you're able and join me in singing our hymn of praise, All Creatures of Our God and King. 
found on number 62 in your hymnal.
May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Thanks be to God. We had a, a really exciting sort of, it's not a coincidence, it's a movement of the Holy Spirit over at first. I had not talked to the person who was doing our children's time about where I was going with this week's um, portion of Psalm 98, other than she knew that the sermon title was Rejoice Out Loud. But she began the children's time by having the whole congregation help the kids to sing the first verse of Joy to the World. Little did she know that I was also planning to talk about Christmas caroling. Because when I hear this text, I can't help but remember how much I love Christmas caroling. I love the Christmas carols, of course, but I also like the actual act of caroling. You know, that sort of informal thing that, that we get together and do, and often it's around nursing homes or those members of our congregation that can no longer get out to get to church and hear the songs of their faith at Christmas time. I have a, a beloved memory of being caroled too. The year that William was born, his birthday's coming up. He was born on the 13th of December. And so when Christmas rolled around, we hadn't done a lot of Christmas things at the normal time. Just before I was no longer allowed to travel, we had gone to Branson to ride the Polar Express there. Uh, wasn't available as close as Baldwin City at that time. And uh, we had gone to ride the, the Polar Express and see Silver Dollar City all lit up. Uh, in November, as soon as it was available, because I didn't know how soon William would make his appearance. But then Christmas kind of got paused a little bit by all of the hullabaloo of bringing a new baby into the house, and there was some illness that went through the house about the same time as I brought the new baby home and complicated things, and we hadn't left the house in almost 10 days when we were sitting at the dinner table and I heard the doorbell ring. And it was members of Douglas United Methodist Church in Douglas, Kansas, where my husband was the pastor. And we came to the door and left the storm door closed, and they stood on our front porch and sang Silent Night as I stood there holding my brand new baby all swaddled up against me. The glow of the Christmas lights on our porch illuminating the space between them and us. And it felt like one of the most holy moments of my life. Now here's the thing that I will tell you. I love the members of the choir at Douglas United Methodist Church dearly. They're wonderful people. They're pretty good singers. But they're not necessarily singers that I would pay to see on the stage at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> It's a pretty big jump between pretty good for church and folks I would pay to see on the stage at Carnegie Hall, but sometimes in the church we get those things confused. We get stressed about having things performance ready, and I will tell you, as somebody who's in contact with a lot of my colleagues, as a pastor, that has affected us more so in the last 20 months because of that thing right there. Because now everything that happens in worship is recorded. And when something is recorded, you have the opportunity to go back and watch it with a critical eye. It risks becoming performance. But Psalm 98 does not invite <coughs> us into perfect performance for God. It invites us to join creation in the making of a joyful noise. So here's one of the funny things about being a preacher's kid, all grown up to become a preacher myself. After years of sitting in the pew and hearing my dad use me in illustrations as he preached, fair turnabout. I particularly know the, the part of this psalm where it says make a joyful noise to the Lord because my dad has a joke he has used until it is just bruised and bloody. And that is that he would remind people when he went to sing in church choirs and such that he was planning to do it in the key of Q flat. His name is Quentin. 
but that it would be a joyful noise. And that's what the Bible says to do. Now, my dad doesn't give himself enough credit. He is a musician. He plays the trumpet. He can carry a tune if he has to, but his voice is not his primary instrument. But I grew up with that knowledge that the thing that God asks for from us is that we lift a joyful noise. And there's a lot of ways that that happens. The psalmist highlights some of the ways that creation itself, the earth around us, can sometimes lift a joyful noise. You all know what it feels like the first time on a spring morning that you can hear the bird song again. Or perhaps you have had the opportunity to spend time on a beach hearing the waves crash against the shore in that soothing, rhythmic way that we actually try to electronically replicate in my house to get my kids to fall asleep. Sometimes it comes in unexpected ways. A few years ago, Ross and I got to be pastors and residents for a program called Summit that happens at Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas. And uh, this is an opportunity for juniors and seniors in high school to come together for a week of kind of intensive study and discipleship uh, and, 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 and get to study the Bible and, and learn about how to sort of formulate their, their own discipleship and their vocation for the future. And we got invited to be pastors and residents for this, which was a wild, wild experience in and of itself because it meant that we moved our whole family into the dorms that I stayed in my first year at Southwestern as a college student. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. But the first night, we were out at Camp Horizon, one of our United Methodist uh, church camps here in the Great Plains Conference, at their beautiful outdoor sanctuary. And we were, we were in the midst of the Great Thanksgiving for communion, and my, my friend and colleague, Wendy, was in the middle of the Great Thanksgiving, and, and she got to the part with her arms raised high where she said, pour out your Holy Spirit now on those of us gathered and on these gifts of bread and cup. And just as she said those words, there was a swell of cicada noise. Mm -hmm. Deafening. She just had to pause with her arms in midair and wait for it to subside a little bit. Because even with the assistance of a microphone, she was going to have to shout to be heard over it. Ripples of laughter went through the congregation of teenagers gathered there. And I thought to myself as a pastor, that's one of those scenarios you don't rehearse for in seminary. <laughs> but that night, in our small group, one of those teenagers was recounting that moment. And she said, it was like it was like it was the Holy Spirit letting us know she was there. And I thought, you know, it kind of was like that. And it has become one of those joyful memories for me that whenever I hear the swells of the cicadas in the middle of late summer, I think of that moment, of that feeling being in the midst of something holy. This is part of what the psalmist invites us to. That when we make a joyful noise, we invite others to joy. Joy is contagious like that. When we live it out loud. We just saw that last night at the, the high school musical over at the Performing Arts Center. They completed their musical, and, and they did a fantastic job, and we had all clapped and stood for them, and they had taken their bows, and the curtains closed, and there was this eruption of joyous noise from backstage. You could hear them screaming out of pride and joy at what they had just accomplished. And ripples of laughter went through the audience gathered in the Performing Arts Center. We caught on to their joy, feeling just as much pride and happiness for them as they were feeling back there behind the curtain. Joy has a way 
of doing that, of being contagious. Sometimes we need reminders that noise is joyful. I'm a parent. I often need to be reminded that noise is joyful. <laughs> it doesn't always feel joyful, even when I know that it is born out of someone else's joy. For instance, one of my children has become a particularly proficient whistler. And when I say particularly proficient, I mean he can whistle back whole melodies correctly and identifiably. And he does it with all sorts of things, from songs on the radio, to the jingles on commercials on TV, to the same sounds that you know various electronics make around the house. And sometimes I need to be reminded that that's a joyful noise. In those moments, I think about my grandparents. Because my grandparents, my dad's parents, were uh, their house was sort of the place that I think of as home. They haven't lived there for over 10 years. They've been gone for that long. But I still think of, of that place in Papillion, Nebraska as home. In all of the moving around that our family did, that was sort of the place of consistency that was always the same. And it was a place where we were always welcomed with open arms and all of our shenanigans as four young girls brought laughter instead of frustration. And at their house in Papillion, Nebraska, the basement was our domain. Upstairs, things had to be kept the way that Grandma liked them for the most part, with the, occasion, uh, with the exception of the occasional very planned activity with her. We did a lot of baking. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Sometimes she would set up a playhouse for us. But downstairs, she kind of didn't care what we did as long as we cleaned up after ourselves in time uh, you know, for, at the end of the day. And, and their basement was sort of a wonderland for kids. Uh, Grandpa had his wood shop that was completely off limits because there was dangerous stuff in there. You could cut off a finger. He was right, we could have, and it's probably a good thing that he was so stern about keeping us out of there. And there were a few gardening things over by the other door, and from time to time, Grandma or Grandpa would pass through to get something out of the spare freezer, or, or to do some work in their garden. But for hours on end, the rest of the basement was ours. A whole wall of books that we could read, filling our minds with riddles to share with Grandpa at the dinner table, or reading the Nancy Drew or Hardy Boys collection. Over on this wall were cabinets upon cabinets upon cabinets of the kinds of craft supplies that only a retired kindergarten teacher would keep for decades on end. Skeins of yarn and all kinds of those little fuzzy pom-pom things and pipe cleaners and construction paper and whatever else you could imagine. There was a trunk of things that we could use for dress up, silk flower bouquets and corsages from various events, scarves and hats and all sorts of things she had gathered just for us. But our very favorite thing in my grandparents' basement was that they had an upright piano that probably hadn't been tuned in a number of decades, an old guitar that probably had been tuned about the same time as the piano, some play drums, and a tin penny whistle. Now that was just enough instruments for all four girls to have a role in the band. And we played band for hours on end. Now, now that I have become a parent and been through the phase in my own children's life where they liked to play instruments and make a very joyful noise, <laughs> I began to wonder how it was that my grandparents allowed us to do that for so many hours, so many days in a row. And I've landed on two theories, and they're not mutually exclusive. I'm pretty sure it was a case of both and. <clears throat> One is that we only got to be with them a few weeks out of the year. We'd come up on Thanksgiving some years, and then uh, for a couple of weeks in the summer. And so no matter how ruckus and obnoxious our noise was, it filled them with a certain amount of joy just to know that we were there. 
The other is that Grandpa never got hearing aids and Grandma knew how to turn hers off. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I'm pretty sure it was both <laughs> and. <laughs> Sometimes those of us who are in the thick of raising our kids need to be reminded that the noise they make is joyful. Perhaps you saw the look on my face last week as I was trying to decide whether or not the whispers happening between my children was enough to pause the sermon and address, or whether to just let it ride. It's a decision I'm constantly making as a pastor mom. But I know I'm not the only one. Many, many Sundays I have watched as families of little ones try desperately to keep their kids quiet or bring a toy they think is going to be a perfect quiet distraction only to find that that very quiet Hot Wheels car makes a ton of noise if you run it along the back of the wooden pew. <laughs> we need to be reminded that their noise is joyful, that it invites the rest of us into joy, because we remember that their joy is an invitation to rejoice in a God who is good. We need to be reminded that our noise is joyful. Sometimes we get caught up in trying to perform gratitude for God. Trying to figure out the right words to say, to express that we are grateful. And forget that creation itself invites us to simply raise a joyful noise. This can be kind of hard for those of us who have grown up in, in the, the Plains portion of white Protestant Middle America, where we have been taught a sort of stoic attitude towards church and all things related to God. We have been taught that we are to sit in the pew, facing forward, hands in our laps, mouths quiet, absorb what we're taught, sing only the notes that are in the hymnal, and then go home. There are other traditions of Christianity, though, that help to remind us that Scripture and creation itself invites us to be part of making a joyful noise, to lift our voices in praise. Now, I don't expect that anytime soon, Ives Chapel is going to become suddenly a church where we hoop and holler when we hear something we agree with in the sermon. It's okay to be who we are. But I also want to challenge you to find opportunities in the coming week to raise your voice or move your body or do something that makes a joyful noise to God. Maybe for you, that will mean listening to your favorite Christian song on the radio in your car a little louder than you normally would, and allowing yourself to drum on the steering wheel a little bit. Maybe it will be permitting yourself to hum or whistle when the mood strikes you. Maybe it will be as simple as offering verbal words of praise or thanksgiving or joy in the moment when it strikes you. Not waiting to write it down in your journal or put it on Facebook later, but using your voice to speak aloud your joy so that others can be invited into it. Remembering that when we take the moment to pay attention, the psalmist and all of creation are inviting us into joy, inviting us to rejoice out loud in ways that extend the invitation to others. Because there's something phenomenal that happens when Christian communities become places that know how to make a joyful noise. It's a lot like what happened in the Performing Arts Center last night. That joy becomes infectious. People want to be near others who know how to experience joy. They want to be part of catching on to that kind of joy. People want to be part 
of a community that knows how to laugh together, that can smile and rejoice when things go right, that can laugh it off and give thanks for joyful noise when things don't go quite right, that can rejoice in the noises not only of children in the pews, but also of the whole intergenerational experience in a world where we're increasingly divided up by our demographics, our, our TV channels and, and how we are targeted by social media and advertising. It's all done in very narrow demographics. The church has the opportunity to be a place where joy spans the generations. Where the sounds of the baby clanking their toy clumsily along the pew come alongside the rhythmic, rhythmic click clicking of the oxygen machine of a beloved elderly saint. Something really special happens. We're invited to rejoice in God's goodness. And we have the opportunity to invite others to rejoice as well. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. As we think of those who are in need of our prayers this week, I invite you to turn in your hymnal to number 84. Thank you, Lord. We'll sing it twice through. join our hearts together in prayer. Holy and gracious God, you have surrounded us in all of creation with invitations to rejoice in you, to lift our voices in thanksgiving and praise for all of your goodness. And even as we do, O oh God, we remember those whose hearts may not be filled with joy this day. For all of your beloved children, especially those who are sick or suffering today, we ask that they would feel your comfort and your presence. For those who are lonely or afraid, that they might know your kinship, your companionship, and the fellowship of others. We pray for those who experience violence and oppression. And we praise your name, remembering that you are the God who brings 
justice, and righteousness. We pray for those who grieve. We ask that you would send us to bear your light and your hope, that they may know your love and strength. We pray for those who feel caught up by mental illness, by addiction, by a whole host of other things that they feel no control over. We ask, O oh God, that they would experience the joy of your freedom, the power of your grace. And we lift our voices with joy as in the confidence of the children of God as we pray as Christ first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's my hope that it is starting to become a habit to have this moment in our worship in which you are invited to reflect on the places where you have known God's generosity, abundance, and goodness in your life over the last week. And then to consider where it is that God may be calling you to respond in that same abundance, generosity, and out of your own gratitude by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. If part of that response is the financial support of the life and ministry of this church, there's a couple of ways for you to do that. You can share your offering in the offering plate that's at the back of the sanctuary, or mail a check to us at 1018 Miami here in Baldwin City. However you choose to give, however you choose to show your gratitude and your understanding of God's abundance, we are grateful for you. Now, with hearts full of joy, let us make a joyful noise as we sing the doxology together.
now this blessing. May you go from this place with joy, rejoicing that like the mountains, the ocean, and the stars, you have been created by God, taking part in the life and death and resurrection of Christ, which comes to give us eternal opportunities to rejoice and being filled with the Holy Spirit that carries us from this place, making a joyful noise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now we're doing pretty good.